Hello everyone, welcome to another, another live hangout here at Voice Essentials. It's so good to be with you this week. Um, I've, uh, you're going to have to bear with me today. I am, I'm, I'm a little unwell. In fact, I'm a lot more than unwell. I've, I've actually even got my, my box of tissues here ready to go. If I cough throughout today's um, proceedings, please forgive me. Um, but I am so pleased that you've chosen to tune in because I didn't want to miss, I actually cancelled all of my students today because I'm just, I'm just not well enough to teach. But I was not going to miss out on today's live guest. He is joining us all the way from Canada. Dan Minton is going to just bring so much value to the show today and I'm really looking forward to talking with him and allowing you to, to ask your questions, which you can do if you're watching live now. Guys, start leaving your questions. Matt, um, if you're watching, and I know you are because you've been hanging out for the last couple of hours in the live chat, Matt, this is your opportunity. This is the guy uh, who is going to be talking about low voice. If you are into low singing, if you have an anatomically, biologically derived low voice, then you've got to stick around and watch today's show because Dan has so much to offer uh, and he is a low voice classical specialist. We'll talk more to him in a moment about that. If you're watching this as a replay, hey, thanks for jumping in. Most of you watch these shows as a replay, and so it's always good to have you joining us as well. A couple of things before we introduce Matt. Um, first of all, just to update you on Voice Essentials 2, uh, most of you know by now that we are, uh, I've been producing for the last, it feels like forever, it has taken a, a little while, and we've been producing Voice Essentials 2, which is the second collection of contemporary, task-specific, focused exercises, singing exercises, and it is being mastered as we speak. So I am hoping that next week, on Monday, we are going to release Voice Essentials 2. I'm going to have a special sale, introductory price for you guys, so you can grab a copy and download it. Um, there is so much good stuff here. We're going to be covering minor scales, pentatonic scales, not the pentatonic group, pentatonic scales. That's where they got their name from, incidentally. Um, uh, we're going to be looking at things like um, octave runs. We're going to be looking at riffs and runs. There is so much exciting stuff. I was previewing the, the mix mixes of the CD of the tracks. I am really excited about this collection of exercises. It really takes um, the voice to the next level. And so if you are um, really needing to challenge your voice to that next step, Voice Essentials 2 is going to be for you. So I'll talk more about that next week when um, you'll be able to grab your copy. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to show you guys, uh, have a look at this. Um, many of you are already, in fact, let me get rid of that and let me get rid of that and do this. So many of you um, have already subscribed to the Voice Essentials community group on Facebook. Um, we've already got nearly 150 members um, and uh, even on the weekend we had some really great discussion, um, some people um, on uh, um, uh, on Saturday sharing their own performances and people jumping in and giving some great encouraging feedback which is what we're looking to do in the Voice Essentials community. Is a, it is a place of support and encouragement um, because here's the deal, Dr. Dan doesn't know everything, Dr. Dan doesn't, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a guru, don't pretend to be one. There is so much wealth of, uh, of, of experience and support that can come from the wider community. And in the Voice Essentials community group, um, we are seeking to be that encouraging community so that you can um, ask your questions and uh, you can post your performances on a Saturday if that's what you want to do. So if you haven't already subscribed um, to that group, then uh, in this video that, we're watch that you're watching right now, take the opportunity to um, just find the link. Whoops, what am I doing? Come on, Daniel, get your act together. I'm, I'm clicking as we go here. Um, do yourself a favor, click on the link down below in the description section and follow it to the Facebook group and join because it's whilst the group is closed in the sense that it's you've got a you've sort of asked to 
join, um, you'll be accepted and, um, and in you can come and, and really enjoy um, what we all have been for the last week or so since the group has gone live, the supportive and encouragement of, uh, of the group. So without any further ado, partly because I need to stop talking, you, have you ever heard my voice be so low? I was speaking to Dan before the show today and I was saying how ironic it was that my voice is, my fundamental pitch is as low as it is today. This may be the only time you ever get to hear me as a, at least a baritone. Um, but I certainly, um, as you all, all know, am a tenor. And so that's why today's show is so important. We get to invite Dan Minton. Now, Dan is a, a DMA candidate. DMA is actually the, uh, the doctorate that I have. It's a Doctor of Musical Arts. And uh, Dan is studying that. Um, he's actually on faculty at the same university, the Uni uh, Toronto, uh, University of Toronto. And he might be able to tell us a little bit more about that. Um, and, uh, and his specialty um, is in classical voice uh, and in, well, low singing. He's a bass. And so we're going to get to talk to him uh, in just a moment. And so I hope you stick around. Don't forget to ask your questions. We will answer three or four questions at the end of the show. Ask them in the live chat because Linda is collating and doing all the things that Linda does. She's awesome. Um, and, uh, and we'll get to those at the end of the show right after this. Sound check. Check one. Check two. Hey, Dan. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Dan. It's so good to have you uh, with us today. And, uh, and you are literally joining us from pretty much the other side of the world, uh, Toronto in Canada. And uh, it's so good to have you join us. What time is it in your part of the world? Uh, it's just a few minutes after midnight here. Yeah. See, this is the awesome thing about all of my guests. You all come on at, at the most craziest of hours. So thank you very much for, for doing that. We, we uh, on behalf of the Voice Essentials community, just so thankful to have you to join us. So tell us, just briefly, tell us a little bit about yourself. You, I mentioned that you're at the University of Toronto. Uh, I am, actually. Uh, just a, a small tweak to what you had to say earlier. I'm not on faculty at the ah, University of Toronto. My I bad. A doctor, uh, I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Toronto, so uh, any teaching that I do there is, is as a teaching assistant. Ah, okay. Uh, I will have my doctor probably by Christmas time, so Excellent. any minute now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the day is coming. Keep going. Keep going. It, it, you, you'll get there. It's uh, you've probably for that being said, you're probably through the hardest hardest part, are you? You you feel like you're Most nearly there. I'm, I'm what they call ABD, all but dissertation. All but dissertation, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> most of my life now is is about writing and footnoting what I wrote. Okay, uh, very good. My well, thank you for correcting my my bad information there. Um, so tell us um, about your. Um, about your your history of singing and and performance and um, how it is that you came to discover your a bass vo voice. Oh, um, okay. Uh, well, I've been a classical singer for about twenty five years. I've had a small regional career, and um, I've been lucky enough to participate in some of the best young artist training programs uh, during that time. Um, I like like many people. I started singing in church, and um, I always had a an interest in in singing. And uh, when I discovered that you could actually go to, to university for that, I jumped at the chance. Um, when I was an early singing student, um, it seemed like singing teachers were conservative in the use of the word bass. And so any low male voice outcome singer would be called a baritone. Um, and as it turns out, I was never a baritone, I am a bass. Um, uh, evidenced probably by the fact that my mom was a lady tenor and my dad sang in the bass section. So if we inherit physical attributes like noses or ears, we probably inherit physical attributes like vocal tract shape. And uh, it, it makes sense that if both my parents were low voice singers, then I, I would be too. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, uh, for me, um, even though I love performing, um, 
I love teaching and um, it seems a very good fit to um, move into the pedagogy stream or basically teaching teachers how to teach mm -hmm. voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, and so you, um, when I first asked you to, to participate in, in one of my live hangouts here, um, you, you, you were hesitant because, it, because you, you are, you know, specifically, you know, classify yourself as a classical specialist. What, what do you, you know, um, and, I, and I was quick to try <laughs> reassure you that, you know, I felt that you'd bring so much posit, you know, so many positive things to, to our discussion today. What, what do you feel are the main um, differences between uh, classical singers and, and contemporary singers as you see it? What do I see as the main differences between classical singers and contemporary singers? Um, well, it, that's such a, even a broad question because yeah. it isn't as if you can divide singers into those two camps per se, because yes. even thinking about classical singers, well, well I mean, do, do you mean, you know, early 1920s radio careers inside yeah. that? Or do you mean Mozart specialists? Do you mean Wagner singers? There's so many different stripes of, of um, art singers who do art music. Yeah. Uh, just like you can't really make one group out of pop music singers. Um, there's, you know, music theater, there's, um, you know, there's screamo, there's yeah. um, like radio pop. So um, in, in the broadest sense, I think classical singing strives for an equality of tone across the entire range. Um, and I find, and this is just me talking, uh, I find that that's less um, required in pop music. And I s see and hear a lot of artists reframing extreme timbre changes across the, the reg their, their range um, as a virtue, as a feature rather than bug. Um, so you'll hear a little bit of a yodel or you're, you'll hear, uh, you know, one, one voice for the low bits and then that, that other um, timbre for the, the high bits. And that's completely acceptable in pop. Whereas in classical singing, we strive to disguise those, um, those, perceptible differences and kind of blend them out of existence almost you know mm -hmm, you, you mm -hmm. want your lowest pitches to have something to do with your highest pitches yeah okay so it's that sense of connection throughout perhaps i think continuity of voice is okay. very important for classical singing okay. whereas in pop i mean identifiable is great yeah but you kind of get to know what a singer sounds like down low versus what they sound like up high and you yeah yeah, I think identifiability is, well, you know, as I think out loud, the, the minute I say something, I can think of six counter examples, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I think it's possible to plug in, to, re, to reframe any kind of technical, um, any personal technical affect as a feature in pop music where I think classical singing is less forgiving of that particular, um, uh, of that particular aspect. I think classical singing wants you to have a nice even scale and um, a nice consistent um, a breath economy and um, uh, a real um, maybe conformance or at least a tip of the hat to a standard of, of vowel inventory. And in pop music, we expect um, personal tweaking to, to all of this framework. So you can, you know, break your vowels and, you know, thanks, Sean Mendez, and that's acceptable. <laughs> or you can have, you know, a, another, um, like I said, those, those register shifts, you can, um, have a breathier tone in some parts or, or, or less so in others. And that kind of variation is less appreciated in classical than it is in pop. Yeah. And, and, and listening, you know, to you make the really valuable point before about the moment you, you think of, of, of the, the so-called rule, you immediately can think of six, six exceptions to said rule. You know, there are so many things about 
contemporary vocal and um, for those who are watching and may not sort of understand that the the there's a there is a, an acronym used quite widely now CCM um, contemporary commercial music um, I tend to use another a, a different one which means exactly the same thing PCM popular culture music any which way you you any acronym you choose to use um, uh, for for it's it's almost like the the very same standards of ex expectancy that we have in the contemporary uh, sorry the classical voice as you're saying for example that consistency from you know from bottom to top we almost in some genres we go looking the expectancy is for that to not be there it, it's almost it, it it flips it right and so it's not that it it if it's there it's okay actually no it's not okay that it's there so and that, this is the Go for it. Yeah. These broad strokes are tough to speak in because I think that may be true in some genres of PCM, yeah. but in in others where mix is um, is sort of the 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 gold star, then you are sort of blending the registers to some degree to try and achieve that consistency in a sense. So, yeah. and and yeah, like counter examples, right? Yeah, this is this is the difficulty, isn't it? Um, but yet we, you know, we do, you know. In our world, we do tend to sort of build these broad brush strokes, as we say, for, for you know, they, it, they have their place and so, and, uh, so we, we move on. So thinking about um, when it comes to, let's, let's, let's zone in on, on you and uh, here on, I'm a tenor. <laughs> I don't sound like a tenor today, but nonetheless, uh, I am a tenor. My fundamental pitch is, is wonderfully... Well, it's not one. There's nothing wonderful about it, um, but it is lower today. Uh, now, I some would say I am, you know, naturally blessed with a high voice, because in contemporary vocals, um, it we this is what we mostly hear. We mostly hear on the radio and in you know, the top forty. We mostly hear um, tenors. We mostly hear high mezzos, you know, what, but, but the, the harsh reality of the world is, and we were talking about this earlier, is that the vast majority of the population, certainly from a male standpoint, is that they're mostly, the, the, the vast majority of the population is baritone, or at the, at, at the very highest, you know, high baritone, what some people would refer to as um, uh, baritone, sort of, what, what do we call that? Um, baritena. Um, but, but not everyone is. is and not, sorry, not every, so not everyone is is a high voice. Um, you know, the, the vast majority are, are, are in the middle, and and yet um, it, that would sort of on the size. And when we think about population, that kind of almost rules out. You know, the vast majority of the population have, getting to have a go, and yet we have ones like yourself who've got these wonderfully deep, resonant voices that I personally think should be heard and should be heard more. When did you really, um, you know, um, embrace your anatomy, so to speak? Does one have a choice? Um, <clears throat> embrace your anatomy. Well, that is a... Maybe a different way a, to put it. Embrace your identity as a singer. Whoa, okay. Um, it's been a long time s since I, I sort of thought about that. Mm. Um, I think, okay, um, I'm interested in uh, low male voice development. And for me, um, that begins meaningfully, well, it, I guess it begins meaningfully at conception because what I had to say earlier about you inheriting um, your parents' morphology, that, that sort of stands to reason. But um, the male voice really starts to self-identify um, in, an, in and after puberty. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're pubertal and you're uh, going through male expanding voice and you discover at age 13 or 14 that all of a sudden you can pop down to a low f or, or or low you know whatever um 
that's an interesting party trick for a while until you discover that it's consistent or not, right? Um, so for me, that was the case. I discovered that uh, I could sort of fake a, a sort of a barbershoppy basis sound. And um, the higher register was more challenging for me. Uh, so when I entered um, university and um, was first being assigned repertoire, um, low low keys, low transpositions seemed to work best for me. And those were what my teacher found and assigned. And um, I, at a certain point, I guess I assumed um, that, that the word bass was a, an identifier for me. Um, like I said, in my early education, the educators were reticent to use that word. And so they did use baritone. Mm. Um, for me, um, I think I was in my 30s before I really started to insist on the word bass. Mm. Um, that had to do with picking out a bunch of repertoire and, and going through a, a process of trying to self-identify and find my fach, the, that, the collection of repertoire that suited me best mm -hmm. uh, or that I felt suited me best. Um, yeah, so... Um, I, and again, in saying that I, that I was in my 30s when that, that was the case, I want to stress how important it is not to pigeon your, pigeonhole yourself too mm -hmm. early. Yeah. So many people, um, I get the impression that younger singers or avocational singers are eager to label themselves mm. to self-identify. And that is a mixed bag. I mean, on the one hand, yeah, it's, it's nice to know what you are, but you have to understand that, for instance, in classical music, the reason those labels exist is actually market-driven. Yeah. Those labels exist for two reasons. Number one, so that an opera house will know how many roles it can expect you to play if they hire you for a season. But it's also a protection to the singers so that they cannot be asked to sing a role that is not in their particular category, right? Yeah. Um, if you've got a, an avocational singer or just a recreational singer wanting to self-identify with a, a, a Fach from the German system, I think that's a bit overkill because... They don't need to respond to the demands of an opera season. They need to just sort of understand themselves. And so sometimes it's enough to just understand that they sing in the second soprano section or understand that they sing in the bass section. And, you know, I, I, I want to stress that the label is not important, but being kind to yourself and understanding yourself and giving yourself the room to sort of be at home in a certain place, but experiment with, with, um, excursions into the high and low that's that's got to be where you are if you're going to grow properly uh i i did i answer your question yeah well um I'm, i can't remember what my question is because my head is that oh. fuzzy from being unwell but what i i loved what you said though um and and it's something that um so resonates with with a message that i'm constantly trying to deliver here um within the voice essentials community and that is don't be so hung up on voice type. It's, you know, and look, in contemporary vocal, it just really isn't, it's not something that we, it has its place, and I'm never looking to devalue it to the point of it being non-consequential. But it's a matter of keeping it in check, making sure that you don't, you know, put a branding, you know, brander on your forehead and, you know, I'm a baritone, and so therefore I'll, you know, it's, well, using using that as a reason to not do something. I'm a baritone, tone, therefore I can't do X. Lovely. Well, my my thoughts about that too are okay. Say a young bassling gets um, miss through the color of his voice. If it sounds a little lighter or a little bit um, uh, brighter, maybe he gets sat in the tenor section in his school choir, and that's a mistake for him because he's a bass, but he doesn't know it. Yeah. You're going to feel that. You're going to yes. feel your larynx jammed up. You're going to feel tired. You're going to feel limited. Your body is going to tell you that that's not a good fit. And so you adjust accordingly. You always listen to your body. So let's, let's talk about then the, because the, you've just mentioned a couple uh, in, in, indirectly. Let's, let's talk about the special, the characteristics that, that low male voice um, or what you in a note sort of deemed as LMV, um, you know, low male voice, what, what are the key characteristics that someone who, who is looking to um, 
embrace their low male voice identity and acknowledge that that's what they are and you know what what are those key characteristics uh well there are physical key characteristics but we can't actually see them mm. under normal circumstances i mean i suppose it is possible to to use your iphone as a kind of laryngoscope and have a look um but physically <laughs> Uh, a low male voice singer is going to have folds. The vocal folds themselves are going to be just a little bit thicker. Yeah. Uh, and often that will mean that they that they meet um, that there's more surface contact and a, and a greater close quotient, yeah. um, which will mean sort of a, a louder signal, a more robust yeah. signal. Yeah. So uh, that's possible. Although there are also light bases out there. So again, always exception to the rule. Um, but physiologically, yeah, um, it's not so much range that that comes with time. Uh, low male voices have thicker, bulkier folds. Um, they also have a longer vocal tract. For instance, I'm six foot two, so I'm a tall man, and my the the space or the the length between my folds and and my lips, the vocal tract is quite long. Um, I'm not saying that that corresponds to height necessarily. I'm just saying it by way of sort of situating that in a physiology. Di dimension. Because, yeah, of yep. course, you know, I think John Shirley Quirk was famously, uh, he's a, a famous classical bass and he was famously quite short. Um, but his vocal tract would have had to have been much longer than his soprano colleagues, for instance. Sure. So there's some physical differences. Um, and I don't want those physical differences to justify or imply that bassists can't experiment in their high register. And we do that by, you know, raising and lowering the larynx and by thinning out those folds. We also can sing in falsetto. And I think it's important, actually, that every voice type experiment with their head voice or falsetto or whatever you want to call it, mode two, whatever, whatever. Um, what else defines a low male voice would be where the registration points fall. Um, so I have a, I have a, a, a break or basically a, a passaggio event around, I don't know, C sharp or D, which mm. is quite low. Mm. Um, mm. and you know, another bass might have one between D and E flat, you know, and, yeah. and that's going to differ from a tenor, which if you're a tenor, I imagine your, your break is probably what around F sharp then. Sorry, my, my phone just went off. Um, uh, let me just hang that up. My apologies. Um, my, my, oh, why is that doing that? Go, go away, go away. End. You can go away. Um, uh, my, I tend to, my, mine will be around about G. Um, I, even I, higher than I sit, so, I sit quite high. Yeah. So you can already see that you and I are separated by about a fourth. Yeah. Right. And so those registration events become even better indicators than um, range extensions because yes. you can extend range over time to a certain amount, but your registration events sort of, once your voice is stabilized, they sort of are what they are and you yeah. negotiate around. Them. Yes. Um, so tessitura itself, where you're comfortable singing, if you find that you do, your voice just likes to sit low when it lives there, you can pop up for, for a little while, but you come back down. That's a good indicator. And uh, finally, um, color. Uh, the color of a low male voice is gonna, um, it needs to feel settled and not pressed. Yeah. Uh, so when you've got somebody really trying to, you know, let you know that they're a bass and, and they're really pressing down on their mechanism as they sing, that's not going to lead to a free, um, sound. It's gonna, it's gonna carry over into the singing and limit what you're capable of. Um, yeah. And I have met. Uh, a few baritones in my studio who have approached me because they self self-identified as hopeful low male voices, and <laughs> we're pressing good. and we're pressing themselves into a lower extension. And yeah. so once we get rid of that, I'm like, "You're a gorgeous baritone. Why wouldn't you want to be yourself, regardless?" You know. Can can we uh, just can we just also identify that? So and and you we were talking about this before that um, before the show that that your voice presents your your spoken fundamental presents almost baritone doesn't it it's 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 high and i don't yet, know why i have i seem to have a high speaking voice for a bass it's just where my larynx likes to sit yeah and do you know what though i i think actually um it, anecdotally 
I've got no research to back this up, though, though it may exist, I don't know. Um, anecdotally, though, I think that um, many people's fundamental pitch, when it sits comfortably, will actually sit um, often higher um, than what they would normally want it to, to sit at. Um, well, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't know. I mean, cause there are also, you know, we think immediately about there are six exceptions. James Earl Jones has like the, the incredible <laughs> voice or someone like Morgan Freeman, you know, again, these gorgeous, just beautiful, dark voices naturally. Yes. Well, that, they've never stepped into my studio. So, so they're not a part of my data sample. No, but don't you want to hear them sing? <laughs> I'd love to hear them sing. Uh, but I think back to a good friend of mine, I was talking with, uh, about him with you um, earlier, um, Eddie Mulia Marcelli, uh, Mulia Marcelli is his name, and I went through uni with him in my undergrad years back in the 90s, and he, uh, he, I think he still sings for the Australian Opera, and he's a bass, and um, the most, most gorgeous, resonant bass voice and yet um but wouldn't necessarily not not dissimilar to you i think his fundamental was possibly a little bit lower than you but um you you might be you might be um uh certainly back then you may have thought oh he's just low baritone but no he he can go right down there mm. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I would say, um, and here, maybe this is looping back to a part of our earlier conversation. Um, another trait, I think, for low male voices in classical is that we mostly work in mode one mm. or chest or thick or modal, whatever you want to call that, right? Um, so whatever your terminology is. Um, and in pop music, there's there's more um acceptance of a head or mode two or falsetto um in in classical art music when a bass sings in falsetto it's comedic um, yeah right or or it's subversive because um classical music often draws on certain voice types to be archetypal and basses are um, the patriarchy, we're gods, we're fathers, mm -hmm. we're kings, mm -hmm. we're demons, mm -hmm. um, basically masculine authority. And so if anyone in masculine authority dares to voice anything in falsetto, it's subversive and it's either comical or, or outside of, of the societal norms. In pop music, this isn't so. In pop music, um, c color and timbre reign supreme. And so <coughs> when when Prince, who is not a bass, Prince is a tenor, whatever. But when Prince sings Kiss in falsetto, it's a brand new timbre that no one knows about. Or when, um, who, who was it? Not, was it D'Angelo or who, who sang uh, that Kate Bush song in falsetto? Oh, this gee, now you're putting me on the spot. Maybe um, someone in the, the chat can, can remind us. Yeah, maybe somebody was. in chat can remind us. But the point is, he sang that, you know, live on MTV, completely in falsetto, mm. and everyone sat on the edge of their chairs because that was a timbre that we were not accustomed to, to hearing, you know? So yeah. I think pop music in that sense is more interested in the, in the novelty of, of timbre that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm thinking of um, uh, a very famous Australian singer, John Farnham, um, on one of his albums back in the, the 90s, did one whole song in falsetto and it was it, it had everyone checking the cd sleeve to to see is, is did he get someone else in to sing what was what's going on and apparently it came about because he was mucking around and they said hey let's keep that that's cool um right. uh so yeah oh can you hear that across i'm i'm getting a, a buzz through my ears hopefully it's not coming across very good um Let's let's just to, to sort of um, wrap up. I, I wonder, do you, is do you approach um, training um, the low male voice um, differently? I, I'm thinking that that the things that you've just outlined um, would would direct perhaps a, a slightly different approach to to how you might work with a low voice. 
Yeah, I love that question. Um, it's it's part of a, a bit that I'm writing now for my dissertation, actually, okay. about uh, low male voice presence in voice pedagogy. So I went into this line of inquiry thinking that the low male voice was underserved by classical voice pedagogy. Okay. Um, and as it turns out, it's not underserved by low male voice classical voice pedagogy. Resources exist, they're out there. Um, there are men marginal mentions in a lot of uh, voice treatises. I, I even think back to uh, Garcia, Ecole Garcia. He talks about basses and how they get sidelined by the baritones in, his, in the theater of his day. Um, so he acknowledges that there's less of a demand for the bass voice as a solo instrument, but um, he does acknowledge their existence. And um, many low male voice pedagogues wrote, like for instance, um, who, who am I thinking of? Miller himself, I think, was a low mm. male voice. Um, oh, was he? Um, I know. I think. Um, yeah. Donald Miller. Donald yeah, Miller was a low male voice singer. Uh, I'm not sure if Venard, I think Venard was a baritone, um, so that's a medium male voice. Mm -hmm. But um, there are also, you know, like Jerome Hines, who wrote that tremendous book. Uh, he was a he was a bass, and mm -hmm. um, the, the the literature has a low male presence in it. So the idea that we somehow should train our basses differently, I don't think stands up. Um, yeah, okay. I th I think that we're interested in in a similar strategy well look what i had to say before about like for instance a voice type representing a certain affect sopranos are you know angels and and uh virgins and purity blah 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 and they have you know runs for days where they're digga, 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 you know in, in baroque literature so of course they have to train in a certain amount of agility but every voice needs to train in agility and strength those are two sides of yes. the singer's point yes um, I do think that um, it's good with a low male voice to let them explore their color mm. um, a, a little bit more because, you know, like your friend that you went to university with, what you're still struck with, at, you know, how, how many years after is just how resonant and colorful oh. his voice was. It's and the most that, gorgeous that sound. Yeah. But ultimately, I do think as voice teachers, we're always striving for balance, mm. that, that chiaroscuro, you know, the light and the dark. Mm. And we're always playing with percentages of that light and dark to achieve, to, to basically move people with our voices. Yes. And I don't think that changes from voice to voice. No. Um, so ultimately, yeah, I'm not sure that there's a special way, but then again, you'll get like, is it Panofka? I did a, I, I'm doing a literature survey right now and there's one primer that is for every voice type except bass. And I looked through the book to go like, oh, what, what secrets do they have in here? And it's basically, you know, scalar stepwise vocalises okay. that are totally doable by basses. It's just in the wrong key for them. Sure. But there's no reason why it can't be, you know, this scalar stepwise G major scale can't be transposed down a fourth and used for and a bass. So yeah. that they would market it for every voice but bass sort of belies this kind of idea that somehow basses are segregated from regular pedagogy. They're not, you know? I love where you just arrived just before, and that was you basically just arrived at ultimately it's about um, using the voice to, 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 to communicate the narrative. That's what, regardless of, and this is something that, look, you know, the Voice Essentials community is probably <laughs> sick and tired of hearing me say it but it's that's that's ultimately what we're here to do we are here to communicate and we use like an actor uses um you know uh script and like a painter use uses you know oil we, we you know oil paint we, we use we use melody um but ultimately well, it's text, text and melody t text yes. and melodies excuse me um to to but but it's all about communicating um, a narrative, communicating a message, and um, and uh, it's it's then we all bring something different to the to to the stage, in a sense, to do that. And if you're if you're a bass, then you you get to be you get to have jealous tenors, you know, looking at you and wishing that they had that that resonance. And and the lower voices, 
you know, uh, often looking at the high voices going, gee, I wish I could hit the high C. Um, you know, we're all, we're all looking at our voices in, in, through the lens of what we don't have instead of actually settling for ourselves um, what we do have and, uh, and celebrating that. That, that's, that is, um, that's a watershed moment for the artist to be at home with who you really are oh. and to celebrate what you have to offer and what you have to work with. Yes. Can you, can you identify that, that watershed moment for yourself just as we come to an end? Can you, can you remember? Yeah, how I talked about it. I honestly, um, I don't, you know, I made my first marketable, what I consider marketable, uh, grown up based noises when I was 35, yeah. which is quite late when you look at me next to my soprano colleagues who were winning competitions at 22. Um, so for me, you know, I remember my first professional gig, it was with a small company in the East, in uh, Eastern Canada. I was playing um, Zoroastro in the Magic Flute. And it was a strange experience because all of a sudden my jokes were funnier and people wanted to hang out with me after rehearsals. And, you know, I didn't understand um, what had changed except that I had a great technical underpinning and that my voice was compelling but I was the same person, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think people are, are funny that way in terms of responding socially with generosity once they think that you're a good singer. You know, I've experienced that and it's, I mean, it's nice, but at the same time, you know, we're all just sort of patching together our, our, our technical bag of tricks and trying to make good art with yeah. what we have. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm dancing around your question, but I, I can't really. No, that's point okay. Got it all together. It's, you know? it's interesting. Look, I I remember it wasn't until my, um, I think it was it was very much, I think it was early 30s where I, um, I really felt like I was able to, um, trust my tenor voice, that it that it wasn't going to hit that top C and and break, that it was going to be secure, that it was going to be um uh stable um and and just you know and so i think there comes a, a time but see for you and and it would have been for me as well um the you know the, that's preceded by um you know a decade for me it was a uh, it was a decade of conservatory you know work before you know and lessons and and in, you know um working with the voice before the um, and I think, in part, for, for the male voice, um, that ossification of the larynx certainly helps. It's the maturity of the, of the, the mechanism. I see you questioning that. Have you got any thoughts on that? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about your friend from university who was a competition winner and a bass. Yeah. And that the triple unicorn, because I was a bass, but I was never... While I was in my younger studies, you know, going through my my bachelor's degree and my artist diploma, I was a great artist. Like I had I had the the, the messaging and the the, the research and mm. the, the knowledge behind the characters, but I couldn't get my mechanism to dance the way I wanted it to. Mm. It just wasn't a competition. Well, winner. well, the piece of inf missing, missing information which I need to give you is that he was a mature age student. He was ten years older than me. Well then. That, and so that makes sense to me. it does you know, make I, sense, I, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I think as a rule of thumb, um, the lower the voice, the longer the maturation arc. Yeah. Okay. So you, you might be an outlier in the sense of being a high male voice with a longer arc. That's yeah. possible. Or maybe I was just a slow learner. <laughs> but you know what? At the end of the day, that is perfectly, all, that's perfectly valid too. We yeah. all have to legitimately grow into our strength and it takes some of us us you're not alone it takes some of us longer yes and that's okay yeah that is okay it has been so good to chat with you today thank you so much for um for 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 you know bringing your 
wealth of, of um, experience and knowledge to, to our conversation. I wonder if you'd just be kind enough to stick around. There's, some, there's a number of questions actually that people have been leaving in the live chat. So would you be happy to stick around and, and talk through some of those? Oh, my pleasure. That'd be awesome. Thank you. We'll come back right after this. Okay, so the we've got gee, we've got a number of I'm do you know what I'm gonna give I'm gonna give our first question to Matt because he has been Matt has been so wanting to have this discussion with with you and and to to be a part of today's live chat. He's been hanging out for it. So we're gonna give the first because Matt is a, a low voice. He says, um, my voice goes as low as C one and even C zero. What is my fach? Oh, wow. Um, so, uh, Matt, if you were listening to the conversation <laughs> earlier, you'll have a clue about what I think about fach already. So if you ask me, what is my fach? I'm going to ask you, what opera house are you singing at? <laughs> yeah. um, in, in my opinion, Fach, or for those of you who don't know, F-A-C-H is the German word, and it, it literally means pigeonhole. <clears throat> and um, questions of Fach, or basically vocal category, a vocal pigeonhole, are only relevant in the German operatic system. Um, and they're there for two reasons. They're there to protect the house so that they know that you can sing all of the roles that they will need you for for their season, but they're also there to protect the singer so that you cannot be asked to sing a role that's outside of your Fach. Mm. So uh, if you ask me what Fach you are, we can, we can put a label on it, and the way I would do that is by taking a look at the registration events in your voice, where, where your break sits, uh, taking a look at your range, um, where your low and your high notes are usable, uh, usable solo. I, I have trouble believing that your C0 is a usable solo pitch. Yeah. Uh, for instance, I'm a bass, and the literature itself, the lowest note that a solo bass um, note is written for is a C, a C2. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and anything underneath that is going to be a nice party trick. Yeah. Even... For instance, um, I'd be a bass three in the Rachmaninoff Vespers, which is a choral piece, and the lowest pitch that that goes down to is a B flat two, yeah, or, or B flat B flat one, whatever. Right. Look, I have that note reliably when I sing in choirs, but you're asking me about your Fach based on range, and I think that the question of Fach is more complicated. You need yeah. to know your registration events as well as your complete range, and then you need to take a look through. There's a book. Uh, by Kloiber and a bunch of other uh, a bunch of other authors, but basically Kloiber, K L O I B E R is the name. It's called Handbuch der Oper, or basically the Opera Handbook. And inside of it, it gives a list of all the Fächer. Fächer is the plural of Fach in German. So it gives a list of all the Fächer and which roles correspond to them. So you would have to take a look at those roles and sing through a few of those arias and see if they're a good fit and if yeah. anything feels. High or too low, you try the next next fach over. Yeah, that's how I did it back in the day. Okay. So I'm sorry, Matt. There's no quick answer to your question, that's... but I also counsel you to stop worrying about fach and start worrying about how to work your mechanism. That's great. Great answer, Dan. Thank you. Galaxy Light asks, "What do what do you what to do when you are sick and want to improve your voice?" <laughs> Galaxy, I, uh, yes, I hear you today. What do you I do when you like, I feel like we should give that and pass that one back to you, Dan. Well, um, you should you should be if I you should be doing what I should be doing, Galaxy Light. And you should be in bed. Is it, <laughs> last night I had to lead worship in my church, and I was so sick I actually got my son to take the lead vocal um, because I, in fact, I'd been in a I'd been doing a a vocal seminar only uh, the week before. Um, where sorry, two weeks ago, where I'd said, you know, I'd actually actually created this hypothetical scenario that actually ended up being my scenario last night, and and I had to follow through with what I'd said in the the thing, and that was I didn't sing. My voice, my vocal folds are so swollen, um, they have so much retained fluid to protect them, that actually um, even the amount of talking I've needed to do today is is really 
be on the pal and I I really need to to vocally rest um, and certainly if you were if it was, if I was in a professional show last night then I would go looking to do um, other things maybe to sort of think but we, we th those at Galaxy I don't know whether you're a professional or a vocational singer but um, Always preference vocal rest and, and over vocal use if you're sick, where possible. What do you think, Dan? I think that because Galaxy is asking about when you're sick, yeah. we're going to make some assumptions, and we assume that that is sick with a cold or sick with the flu. Correct. I'm going to assume that Galaxy is not asking about injury. If you're yeah. injured, that's a different, a completely, completely different yes. question. Uh, but if you're sick with a cold or sick with the flu, uh, again, what Dr. Dan is saying, um, it's important to know your level because if you're an avocational singer who just likes to sing and is sort of at the ground floor of things, maybe better to wait until you're be better and yeah. well. If you're a professional singer and you have a bedrock of technique, then that's what technique is for. And it is possible to sing through or over a cold. Mm -hmm. um, rest is good. Hydration is fantastic. Okay. Yeah. When I tell you hydration, that means water. It doesn't mean, you know, soda or caffeine or things that are going to make you get rid of the water that you're bringing to your system. So drink water, tea is, is fine, you know. Um, but I want to remind those of you who are watching that when you hydrate, it is systemic. It's not topical. What yeah. I mean by that is that your epiglottis stops anything you swallow from yeah. contacting your folds. So the idea that you can drink tea and that it's massaging your folds with its moisture is ridiculous. You'd have to be inhaling it. You'd, yeah. you'd have to be choking on it in order for that to happen. Te technically, that's known as drowning. There we go. <laughs> or you'd basically be aspirating fluids. So I, I, I want to just stop right now with the idea that anything that you're drinking can can actually physically contact your folds. What happens is that you drink liquid and it enters your system and then your system becomes hydrated and that speaks to your, uh, and that eventually comes to your folds. And I, I say that with the additional warning that if you feel thirsty, it's already too late. Yeah, right. Okay. Yep, absolutely. So be sure to hydrate, 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 yep. pee clear. Yeah, yeah, pee clear, absolutely. We're gonna to go to one more question. I'm gonna give it to someone who, I'm, I'm not familiar with um, death, doom, darkness, um, but nice to have you with us, I think. Um, death, doom, uh, darkness asks, how do I get lower notes without pushing too hard and ruining them? I feel like I can push to E2, but only for a fraction of a second, and it is crazy uncomfortable. My lower third octave is very resonant. Huh. Um, well, I think death doom that you're onto something with pointing out what's already resonant and i think that the world needs less party trick singers and more solid technicians so if you're interested in exploring your lower register i think you already know that pushing is probably not the answer um i think it's best for you to explore what is resonant and try a semitone below mm. that and see how that feels and notice for any shifts and changes. Mm. Um, my experience is that pushing is not, never the answer and what we're looking for is a release, something that's gonna help lengthen your vocal tract in a very um, organic way. I think there's a difference between uh, and uh, I hope you can tell the difference. Uh, definitely, yeah. Pressing, right? So if you find that you're pressing, knock it off. Yeah, yeah. And the same would go in contemporary vocal as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, you don't want to have the, the larynx valving against, you know, unwanted pressure and, and those sorts of things. Dan, thank you very much for, for hanging out with us today. It has been um, such a, a pleasure to have you on the show, and uh, I know that you're you're a very active member of a lot of Facebook um, uh, groups that that I'm also on. I see you, so we interact quite a bit um, on Facebook. So it's been wonderful to have you um, join me on the show today. And uh, so, so let me just uh, wrap today's show up. I really 
am so thankful for, for, for having you. So thank you. I'll say goodbye for the moment. So there you go, everyone. Wasn't that fabulous? Dan is just, um, you know, you can really hear the, the passion he has for, um, for classical voice beyond just the low male voice. But, uh, and uh, what about some of those notes that he was hitting when he really gave some wonderful, uh, you know, description uh, practically of, of those, those notes, especially that last one it was beautiful. Um, uh, if this is the first time you've ever hung out with us, please um, take the moment to subscribe to the channel, hit the white bell icon. I hope you've enjoyed today's show. We do these live hangouts every Monday at 2 p.m., even when Dr. Dan is as sick as a dog. Next week, I am really hoping that we get the opportunity to, um, to, to talk about Voice Essentials 2. I want to talk you through some of the exercises that are on there. And um, I'm hoping you can join with us. If you've enjoyed today's show, take a moment to hit the thumbs up button and, uh, and just you know, show your appreciation for, for what Matt, uh, sorry, uh, Matt, what Dan has been able to share with us today. I hope to see you again in the next Voice Essentials video. I'm Dr. Dan. Sing well.